had the idea of sponsoring a round table. And so we're getting this marvelous kind of um, event today. Um, I'll just say briefly that um, although we're now kind of into technological innovation by being online, um, the political thought association, well, the British and the Britain and Ireland Political Thought Association Conference goes back a fair way in the UK into the 1970s. Um, and not far from that time, in 1980, I believe, History of Political Thought, which is, um, which is published by Imprint Academic um, and a wonderful journal was set up. Before that date, there was no specific journal for the history of political thought. And now and ever since um, 1980, which the editors were Ian Hampshire Monk and still are, in fact, Ian Hampshire Monk and Janet Coleman, the, um, if you want to read quality articles on the history of political thought, there is a very clear place to go. And that is that journal, History of Political Thought. And long may it, continue and to flourish and imprint academic. Imprint academic are kind of uh, a brilliant organization. If you want to kind of find out about British idealism, they're in the vanguard of it. Um, I've been, uh, you know, although it's not a good time for maverick conservatives, um, I do like reading Michael Oakeshaw and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and Imprint Academic have been publishing lots of lots of his work, uh, previously unpublished work, as well as secondary sources, and, and that's great. Uh, and actually, more close to home, they also, um, at very short notice, decided that they would go ahead and publish a book I was editing on uh, Bob Dylan at 80, and that's been a lot of fun. And they've been, um, you know, musicians and political theorists and philosophers have been involved, and it's, it's going well. And it's confirmed to me what a wonderful job um, Keith, Imprint Academic, and the journal History of Political Thought do. And at this point, I hand over to the chair for the session, Ellen Lammore, who herself is an author of the book, um, Open Democracy, Reinventing Popular Rule for the 21st Century. Thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Ellen Lammore from Yale University. It's my pleasure to chair this session on the new book by Professor Jeff Miller, Democracy in Crisis, Lessons from Ancient Athens. Um, it's a very timely book uh, on the anniversary of the January 6 um, invasion of the capital. Um, Jeff Miller is a professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the State University of New York at New Paltz, where he teaches political theory. And uh, our professor Ivan Tomea from Paris 8 University and professor Paul Cartledge from the University of Cambridge and Professor Daniela Kamak from UC Berkeley. So I'll just give a very brief introduction to each of the discussions. Uh, I think uh, you can Google for more information, uh, uh, but just for basic um, you know, introductions, I'll say that uh, Professor Saint-Omer is a senior fellow at the French University Institute and a professor of political science at Paris 8 University. <laughs> He's well known for his work on participatory <coughs> democracy and the story of sortition in particular. His many books have been translated in 18 languages. Pro professor Paul Cartledge is the AG Leventis Professor of Greek Culture in the Faculty of Classics at the University of Cambridge. He is also Hellenic Parliament Global Distinguished Professor in the History and Theory of Democracy at New York University. He's a generally revered specialist of ancient democracy, author of more than 20 books and many more articles. Professor Kamak is Assistant Professor of Political Science at UC Berkeley, where she's also affiliated in classics. She's the author of several influential mm -hmm. articles at the intersection of democratic theory and the history of classical Athens. Her first book is Demos, How the People Ruled Athens, uh, and it's forthcoming this spring with Princeton University Press. So uh, we've allocated um, 10 minutes uh, per discussant, and then we'll give uh, Professor Miller a chance to respond in uh, a window of five to 10 minutes. So we're gonna um, start with uh, Daniela, maybe? Um, um, I think... Oh, is it, is it, because on the program it says Daniela first, so I just went uh, by... That. Yeah, well, Jeff, Jeff was gonna give a pre presentation. Oh, a presentation first. Oh, okay, yeah. so sorry. Okay, so... Um, Jeff, then the floor is yours. Uh, we, we could skip tra straight to the comments and cut everything. I don't know, um, that is but true. I, I do have. <laughs> Please, Jeff, sorry about that. I, uh, I was That's okay. That. That's okay. Um, well, well uh, thank you all for coming. Um, let me start out by also thanking 
Keith, uh, uh, for assembling such a really distinguished panel for us today. Um, and, and he's been very patient with me over the past year while I've been writing. Um, so thank you to my fellow panelists who've given up a part of their Friday evening to speak with us today. Thank you very much for coming very, very much. Um, in, in New York, it's midday. I think Danielle is in California. Uh, out in Oxford, I think it's uh, in California, it's what, lunch, right? Uh, out in Oxford, it's, uh, it's almost night, right? So I hope, I'm hoping this panel isn't standing uncomfortably between anyone and drinks. Um, and I guess I should just apologize in advance. I'm at home today. Uh, I have a dog and a child at home and it's a snow day. I've hidden myself in a small office. Hopefully they won't be barging in, but if they do, that's, uh, that's, what, that's what's happened. So I wanna do a, a few things just to begin. Uh, first, I, I wanna start off by talking just a bit about the problems I think uh, liberal democracy faces today. Uh, and I wanna talk about some of the roots of these problems and consider then how I think uh, the Greeks might offer us some assistance in reimagining or expanding our view of democracy. Uh, so first off, the problem, and I guess I should just qualify this by saying that I'm, I'm very unlikely to tell you anything here you don't already know. Quick look at today's times, you pick your version of it, New York, London, Los Angeles, right, tells you everything you need to know about the current mess we're in. Uh, this past week in the United States, we've been reviewing in great detail the storming of the U.S. Capitol a year ago yesterday. Um, and despite the fact that we've had six months of congressional hearings, a handful of prosecutions and convictions, lots and lots of essays, studies, and editorials about the fact, and despite the fact that this act of domestic terrorism played out in real time on screens in front of us a year ago, the U.S. as a country cannot come to a consensus on what exactly happened, on why it happened, <laughs> and, and on what should be done about it. Um, you know, I, I, from my perspective, I think Joe Biden got it right in his remarks yesterday about the Capitol riots. He said that Donald Trump still holds a knife to the throat of American democracies. So internally, the US, like many other liberal democracies, is politically divided. Um, and these divisions hamper our ability to address even minor legislative problems, let alone the really substantial problems that face us today. Some of these problems are structural. Uh, in the US, for example, uneven political representation, particularly in the Senate, disproportionately favors small and rural states. And this combined with the Senate filibuster rules gives a minority of voters an effective veto on legislative proposals. This grinds basic governmental functions sometimes, so let alone attempts at reform, uh, down to a complete halt. Our, our problems lie deeper than structural impediments baked into our, baked into our constitution. We're politically divided but we're also like cognitively divided. We lack a common set of facts to which we can appeal in resolving our differences. Sometimes this prevents us from even addressing small issues requiring simple legislative fixes, let alone real emergencies, true emergencies like the COVID epidemic, immigration crises, and, and the big one, right, global warming. Any issue of substance gets caught up in our political divisions and leaves us arguing over basic facts instead of addressing our problems. We turn to separate news sources, communicate largely with people with whom we already agree, and consider those who we disagree with not as simply wrong about what should be done, but also wrong about the basic fact pattern at the root of the issue. I, it's tempting here to cite Thucydides' description of the civil war in Kosaira, where the nadir of the conflict, he reports, oh, words lose their meaning, right? The Kosairans lacked a common set of linguistic reference points and, and effectively lost the ability to full, pull back from disaster and, and, and the city dissolves, right? I don't think we're at the point where Kosaira is, but I certainly don't wanna get any closer to it. Right? When democratic governments seem incapable of delivering on their promises and, and can't even agree on basic, the basic terms of the debate, uh, this leads to alienation, resignation, distrust, withdrawal among many citizens. There's, a, there's an IPPR, think tank poll of British citizens from last month I saw, it's only 5%, that's one in 20. One in 20 citizens believes their politicians work for the country's best interests as opposed to their own personal gain. You can find similar results in other liberal democracies around the world, certainly in the United States. <clears throat> and we know that this alienation can trigger demands for authoritarian leaders and promise to cut through messy politics. Uh, at an even greater extreme, it can lead people to question democracy itself and become open to anti-democratic systems of government. You all can think just about the number of authoritarian inclined leaders in liberal democracies or quasi-liberal democracies, right? That you can come up with without much effort right off the top of your head, right? There's Donald Trump, of course, he's out for temporarily, hopefully, or permanently, hopefully. There's Bolsonaro in Brazil, there's Viktor Orban over in Hungary, Erdogan in Turkey, 
Narendra Modi in India. It's a long um, and, uh, and growing list. So these populist leaders, they all feed into feelings of alienation, harness anger, distrust, resentment, and they threaten the core, our core democratic institutions. Um, in the US, this has meant calling into doubt electoral results, passing laws to suppress voter participation, and attempting to rig future elections through both legal and extra legal means. Um, shouldn't be surprising to any of you that uh, there was a recent Washington Post poll that showed that 30% and 50% of Republicans in this country think that the use of violence against the government is sometimes justified. That's scary. Roots of the problem are deep, right? Some go back decades and they find their origin and rising levels of economic inequality. Others stem from racist fears about changing demographics, amplified by online and media lies about white replacement or nonsense about white genocide. Many of our political and social divisions are, are, are worsened by our turn to online sources for news and entertainment, something that two years of lockdown under COVID has only made worse. We shop online, we socialize online, and increasingly, witness tonight, right, we work online. Many civic centers Civic organizations have been hollowed out by this, this withdrawal into the private sphere. Global trades also played a role here, of course. I think that you know, Robert Putnam got it right about 20 years ago uh, in his book, Bowling Alone, where he studied the decline of civic organizations in the US during the last third of the 20th century. Many of the groups and spaces where we used to meet with neighbors have vanished. Elks Clubs, Lions Clubs, Shriners, these are all American examples. I'm sorry, you can substitute your own in for them, but they're, they're largely gone. We used to join bowling leagues. Now we bowl alone, or rather, we don't bowl at all. We stay home, we, we watch Netflix, and we, we order in. So I guess that I'm saying that many of our the pressing problems that we face today have been made worse, amplified by social, economic, technological trends of the past couple of decades. But I, I think the roots, roots of the problem go a bit deeper still. Um, in an email sent around to the discussants on this panel uh, about a week ago, Keith referred to the first chapter of my book as a diatribe against liberalism. I was initially taken a little bit aback by the term, but then I went back and I read the chapter. And I thought, okay, maybe that's a fair description, right? I'm a critic of liberalism, um, as well as the atomistic ideas of the self, which I think anchor it. Um, but I'd like my criticism to be viewed as constructive, more like an amicus brief to the court instead of a hostile attack. I, I like, uh, I, like everybody else at this, or probably most people at this conference, I, I grew up in a liberal society. Many of its values are my own. I, I don't wanna see it replaced so much as I wanna see it modified, uh, made better. Uh, so this argument about liberalism, this is of course not original to me. You can find it in many parallel uh, criticisms in, in the literature, but I, I think the point bears repeating at the present moment since it helps explain some of our immediate problems and come at this through what has become for us a, a familiar, if, if really frustrating daily problem. Pretty early on in the COVID pandemic, mask wearing took on a really charged political valence. Uh, in the US, uh, President Trump's initial mishandling and then continued denial of the magnitude of the crisis led him to refuse to endorse the importance of masking in order to downplay the scale of the growing medical disaster. And that's a charitable take on it. For many in the US, refusing to mask up became a sign of political identity uh, justified by an appeal to personal freedom. Mask wearing was a choice. Each person they claimed could evaluate the evidence and decide whether the risk was real and merited additional precautionary steps. As we know, lots of people opted not to wear masks or later to get vaccinations. We get high rates of hospitalization, deaths, new COVID variants, as we're witnessing right now, uh, followed. Right? This, this astonishing capacity of one political party, really one person, to politicize a lethal public health crisis, I think, offers a really sober warning. I mean, for one thing, it should make us reconsider our faith in the efficacy of rationality and scientific explanations in public discourse if we ever had that faith. But the anti-mask, anti-vaccine position is also underwritten by a particular conception of the self, a liberal conception of the self, which seems to provide a justification or a cover really for refusing to comply with sound advice. So setting aside some of the wilder conspiracy theories about pandemic lockdowns, masks and vaccines. In the US, you hear one word over and over and over again, right? Freedom. Many Americans refuse to wear masks on the ground of personal freedom. A government, they claim, has no more right to tell them to wear a mask than it has a right to tell them to wear a jacket or get a haircut, nor can it compel them to get vaccinated, which involves even deeper concerns about bodily integrity and autonomy. <clears throat> the problems with this argument, I think, are too obvious to go into, so I'm not going to do that here. But I will note 
that the liberal conception of the self carries with it a sense of separateness that effectively acts as a barrier between us and our fellow citizens in the outside world. And while many of us appreciate the protections such insulation affords us, everybody likes human rights, this idea of the self impedes the development of community and abets some of the sense of isolation and alienation common, I think, in contemporary liberal democracies. Extreme versions of this atomistic autonomy also partially explain the um, appeals to freedom on the part of anti-maskers. They're, they're willing to recognize many important duties or ties, or sorry, they're unwilling to recognize many important duties or ties they have to other people. Uh, any duties they do recognize are supererogatory. It's not for the government to enforce. So where do the Athenians come in in all this? Well, when I was initially imagining this book, I, I actually started out by thinking about a trend in 20th century continental thought of turning to the ancient world to reground or imagine philosophical thinking. I, I would trace this trend initially back to Nietzsche, though you could go back further, I suppose. Nietzsche dies in 1900, so we'll make him an honorary member of the last century. Uh, Nietzsche began his intellectual of course, or life, of course, as a classicist, and you can trace that strand throughout his thought. It's most prominent in his early work, The Birth of Tragedy, where he complains about the rationalist tendency in Socrates and Euripides and how they subsequently skew Occidental thinking. Setting aside the accuracy of his account, Nietzsche wants to dig back to something before the Socratic turn. And we can see this move repeated over and over again in the 20th century. Heidegger meditates on some lost concept of being. Hannah Arendt tries to excavate an older, uncorrupted understanding of the political and classical Athens. Foucault restructures our understanding of sexuality by turning to the Greeks. Leo Strauss, Alistair McIntyre, Giorgio Gambin. You can kind of list people off. A lot of folks fall into this category. But here's the striking thing about all these examples. They're all philosophers speaking to mostly other philosophers about problems within philosophy, and they're not alone, all right? Classical Athens is still a really rich vein of resource for philosophy, literature, history, um, but not generally when it comes to thinking about contemporary politics. For that, to the extent that we consider anything beyond the immediate present, we look, not surprisingly, I suppose, to our own national histories, or maybe to the Enlightenment. And when political thinkers early on in the US at least thought about the ancient world at all, do you know they thought about Republican Rome, not about democratic Athens. So the general position here is pretty straightforward, right? There may be resources and actual Athenian political practices to which we can turn that can help us make some conceptual space for changes in the way that we think about our situation today. It's not that we can simply adopt Athenian practices wholesale and drop them down in a liberal democracy someplace, but rather that understanding them can help us expand our, our democratic tool chest, expand the range of the possible for us, I guess. As you know here in passing, this is a, a more public facing book than a usual work of political theory. And I, I hope it doesn't require any specialist knowledge to read or understand. Patience is a different thing, of course. The topics are divided up into five chapters, which I'll, I'll just touch briefly on them here. Um, the first deals with the liberal conception of the self and Athenian alternatives. I, I've already briefly alluded to this, so for the sake of time, I'll offer up really brief descriptions of the remaining four chapters. <clears throat> so there's a chapter on ostracism. And for those of you unfamiliar with the practice, this was an annual decision the Athenians took in much of the fifth century to decide whether to send an individual into exile for a decade. Um, and it's one of the earliest institutional practices of the democracy. Um, ostracism first allowed the young democracy to develop in the absence of potentially destabilizing threats of oligarchic retrenchment. Later use of the procedure both helped mediate potential, potentially violent disagreements between the city's elites, as well as placing them squarely under the watchful eye of the people. Ostracism was a much, as much an assertion of the power of the people as a tool of democracy. An important aspect of ostracism was the fact that it was, was not linked to a specific crime. No specific legal offense triggered an ostracism and its victim, could technically be legally innocent of any such wrong or tort. But the Athenians seemed to know that a mass power could warp the space of democratic actions, creating inequalities that no law or procedures could easily contain. Ostracism in this sense was a way for the people to remove potential threats to the city without formal cause. It might also help to think about ostracism in relationship to alternative methods of punishment, such as execution, permanent exile, confiscation of property, penalties for associates and family members. These other uh, penalties all, stake this, this, uh, all set the stakes of punishment really high. Ostracism as the Athenian practi Athenians practiced it, however, always held out the promise 
of a potential reconciliation, of a return to Athens, to one's ancestral homeland. And the fact that it only affected the individual in question, not his family or friends or assets, at least not directly, all of which could remain in Athens in good standings, doubtlessly made temporary exile a more palatable option than violence or civil war. Now, at the beginning of the chapter on ostracism, I talk uh, really briefly about the effect of Donald Trump's ostracism from Twitter, his deplatforming, right, as we call it, happened back in January of 2021, just after the Capitol assaults, right? Many people credit this uh, deplatforming, this removal of Donald Trump from public discourse with reducing the political temperature in the United States pretty significantly um, in the days after the Capitol assault and arguably made Joe Biden's uh, inauguration violence free and maybe even possible. And this helps point the way forward in reimagining this practice in contemporary democracies. We need to consider better and more impermeable firewalls walls to the accumulation of wealth and power, or rhetoric, uh, than ineffective campaign finance laws or lobbying restrictions. Start would be to enforce those laws and then additionally enhance them. But one step better would be to rethink some of our commitments to freedom of speech, especially the, the, the rather extreme version that we, we have here in the United States. Uh, which has spawned a whole set of new problems for us, I think, in the age of the internet. So that's the chapter on, sort, uh, on, uh, on ostracism. There's also a chapter on sortition. Um, and this, I'm sure you all know, but this is the practice of distributing offices on the basis of uh, more or less a random selection. Athens spread power and authority throughout the entire citizen body to a degree not since duplicated. They filled oversight boards with, again, more or less, randomly selected citizens who would actualize the enactments of the assembly. Part of the rationale for this elaborate and, and very time-consuming method of governing, the city was a deep suspicion of accreted power. Very few offices in Athens were held by an individual for more than one year, and the mechanisms involved in the selection of office holders effectively prevented widespread corruption or abuse. But sortition also reveals a really deep faith in the competence of average Athenians. Lottery-filled positions required no advanced knowledge or special expertise. The city assumed rather that average citizens would be able to address administrative issues in the city with relative competence. And when knowledge was required, they could learn from other board members who had experience in that, older board members, or, or maybe bring some of their own experience um, from earlier administrative work or, or business experiences to the, to the question at hand. So instead of having their decisions made by experts or professionals, Athenians, this applies to the assembly as well, of course, right? Deliberated, ratified, and enacted laws themselves. In today's liberal democracies, the gap between the political class and the rest of, po of the population has grown pretty wide. You see this in widespread voter dissatisfaction and a loss of confidence in governments. Um, Brexit might be credited solely to the perceived gap between the bureaucrats in Brussels and the individual voter in New York, right? Athens suffered no such crisis of legitimacy. Each Athenian had a role in making and enforcing laws and politics. Uh, uh, politics were immediate and personal, not distance. Now, you know, in terms of the realm of possibility here, I think sortition is, is one of the happier examples in my book, right? There actually have been some real uh, interesting and provocative experiments and development in sortitions in Canada, the US, UK, other places around the world. You probably all know that Paris, uh, just late last year, I think, adopted a citizen assembly, a mini public, uh, permanently um, to assist uh, them in making their laws, a very promising step there. Um, and we're lucky today ha to have a number of experts on this, on, on the field, especially uh, uh, on the panel, especially uh, Professor Sintomer. Um, I include in the book a chapter which considers how the Athenians finance their massive and expensive investments in the city and the average citizen and the politics of the city. The time individuals spent in the assembly in the law courts, acting on administrative boards in the city, and setting aside even uh, serving in the army or rowing in the fleet on campaign, it's required money. Uh, a poor Athenian citizen certainly couldn't afford to leave his own work uncompensated to perform his civic duties. To facilitate widespread participation, Athens publicly funded civic activity, making it possible, actually probably attractive, uh, especially for the poorest members of, this, uh, of, of the civic body to uh, participate. Athens viewed its citizens as resources and wanted to allow each person to contribute, again, pointing back to a basic and fundamental commitment to equality. Uh, the city financed this participation through revenue from the empire in the fifth century, right? Silver mining by slaves and, and also through taxation of the wealthiest members of the community. 
in the chapter, among other things, I try to outline uh, some of what I think are, are can kind of see glimmers of a very different conception of property at work in Athenian democratic ideology, where once property was sometimes described as a resource for the city and Athens developed effective means of encouraging, sometimes enforcing compliance on the part of the wealthy. Um, we would call the Athenian system today, tax system, a very, very, very highly progressive system of taxation. Um, it wasn't designed to curtail or reduce individual fortunes, uh, rather, um, at least in part, to use them to reinforce practices of equality in the political sphere. Um, Jeff, so uh, I'm sorry to, to interrupt. I, I, yeah. I feel terrible intervening because our, you know, huh? after, after trying to deprive you of your 15 minutes, I, I would hate to cut you short, but you are substantially out of time. Oh, so well, then we can just turn. Wrap up, that would be wonderful. That's, so we'll that's fine. I, we, we can just stop. I, I was going to go through the, the chapters, but we can talk about them as they come up. Um, that's fine. Oh, well, then I, I get excited and I can't well, stop but, talking. But, it, but I mean, I, I think it will be good to have a, a, you know, yeah. a dialogue later on. So maybe we can turn to sure. our, our first <laughs> comment. Sure. So I think it's Daniela. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Alain, for stepping in. And thank you very much, um, Jeff. This is great. I'm happy to meet you. Um, it's our third time. Um, so I really enjoyed the book. Um, I think it does a great public service in trying to inject a bit of Athenian spirit uh, into kind of modern democratic horizons. Um, and I'm gonna be talking mostly about the focus on uh, the chapter on civic life and community, chapter five, just a little bit about that. Um, and I'm especially interested in the parallels and the contrast with the situation that led to the insurrection that, that we just celebrated the anniversary of. Um, especially thinking about the question, um, could it have happened in Athens? If not, why not? And I think there are some relevant institutional aspects of Athenian politics as well as Athenian culture um, that, that are maybe downplayed in the book. So I'll, I'll kind of expand on that a bit. So chapter five kicks off um, with Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone, um, which noted the decline in face-to-face -face interaction in, the American, in American public life since 1965. And Putnam, as, as Jeff points out, fingers technology as the primary culprit. Um, and 20 years later, it looks like the kind of internet digital media landscape um, really it does play a huge role in separating us from one another physically. Um, so I'm quoting Jeff here, the media now fragmented into a bewildering array of, array of sources, each speaking to smaller and smaller groups of people effectively cuts off our access to views different from our own. We hear from and speak to those who already agree with us and consume our news in the quiet solitude of our houses and apartments. Um, and as he notes, things like online shopping, um, and then of course the COVID pandemic only exacerbate those effects. Athenian alternatives to that picture, um, as Jeff points out, they had a, a kind of a, a range of uh, civic and democratic norms, again I'm quoting, um, interlocking customs and civic practices, a number of public institutions that supported and enriched the broader democratic experience and involvement. Specifically, he points to uh, the political organization of the Athenian state, participation in local Deme councils, and major festivals such as the city Dionysia. Dionysia. Um, and his argument is that these are not adequate in themselves, were not adequate in themselves to establish a robust feeling of belonging, but collectively they did provide what he calls a broad civic base for democratic action, orienting individuals towards the public sphere and reinforcing a sense of community. So he highlights within those kind of three, um, you know, three basic in ingredients, he highlights the post clysonic Athenian organization of the, of the state based on local demes, so kind of villages, more or less wards, and artificially constructed tribes rather than family or clan networks and loyalties. That's one major bit of the chapter. Uh, the second is mixing in the council. 500 citizens chosen randomly from volunteers every year, numbers in proportion to Deme size, no more than two years of such service in a lifetime. So there's significant mixing um, uh, through the, the, through the, from the population to the council. Um, the, the, they also work, the, the council has worked closely together to prepare the agenda for assembly meetings and also to supervise uh, Athenian officials chosen by lot, as you said. Those in Brittany, so kind of on the, the, the kind of steering committee of the council, um, also dine and sleep together um, for, for a month, the Bulletic month. Uh, and here, and Jeff actually leaned quite a lot on, Jeff, on Josh Ober's um, semi-speculative reconstruction of life on the council, but uh, it, is a, it is a significant, I'm not sure I would go as far as, as Josh does in saying that it's exactly hi historical, but maybe that's not 
but, but at any rate, it was definitely significant, the mixing that there must have been on the council, although we know very little about it. Really well about it. The city Dionysia, this actually gets the most airtime in the chapter, I think, about the kind of page numbers. Um, uh, the annual major festival, a dramatic festival in particular, several days of plays and feasting, an audience of thousands, maybe 14,000, uh, um, including likely women, foreigners, even slaves, although it seems that that wasn't, you know, that wasn't strictly, it wasn't encouraged, certainly, it was possibly slightly, it was frowned on, but it does seem that the, the evidence we have suggests that slaves did get into the audiences. Um, and here, Jeff, I think rightly, emphasizes a kind of maximally inclusive community building going on um, in, those, in those festivals, annual festivals. And he also emphasizes the way that those festival settings um, kind of were a forum for the representation and the construction of Athenian ideals. So all this is great, I think. Um, I do think that there's something missing, and Jeff has talked about it a little bit, mentioned it um, in the comments, but it's striking that it comes in as kind of an afterthought. So um, he, he does talk about citizens' assemblies um, in the modern context, and he talks about the significance of the assembly a bit in Athens. Um, and I just want to ask a bit more about the the significance that you might attach to the role of the primary mass meeting assembly, um, and specifically the practice of majoritarianism in public, on mass, um, in with respect to the construction of civic life and community in Athens. Because uh, I take it that the way you represent this is something like there's lots of things going on outside the assembly that then help to foster a sense of community within the assembly, and that's what helps them do their democratic politics. I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of what goes on in the assembly as actually itself directly fostering mutual respect, particularly because it's a decision-making institution. And you're literally brought face to face, or not quite, but you can at least see hands in the air of many, many people voting in a different way from the way that you are. And you're forced to share the same physical space. It's not even like the House of Commons where you have one set, kind of one block on one side, another on the other, but it's true mixing and there are lots of votes and you might well vote the same way as people around you on something, but not on something else. So th this is this is the crucible that I want to just flag up as, a, as an arena of significance to Athenian civic life that maybe we downplay because we are not used to mass meetings of this kind at all. So we know the details um, of the, the Athenian primary assembly quite well. I mean, maybe 6,000, 8,000 um, in the audience for much of the classical period, although significantly they expanded it, they enlarged it significantly uh, in the 330s at a great expense. They made in a space for maybe 13,000 sitting down, maybe 20,000 standing up. And I, I think it's entirely possible that they would have wanted to fit in people standing. They wouldn't have insisted that people had to sit down in the meeting. But anyway, so if, if they were standing up, 20,000 people, um, they really valued getting a lot of people in the same place. So that's not like the modern kind of citizens' assemblies where that's much more about small, relatively small samples. Um, but they really did seem to value sheer numbers of people. And the reason I think this is really important is because it tips us off to a major difference, um, uh, kind of one important ingredient in the January 6th insurrection, I take it, as being just that the people who were involved in that did not really believe, I think, at least many of them, did not really believe that they were outnumbered. They really, I think, some of them at least, a significant minority maybe, but a significant proportion, I think really thought that the election had been stolen, that all those people that people said had voted for Biden didn't really exist. They never saw that with their own eyes. They're in their own echo chambers. And they thought that, you know, them as a crowd, as a mass of people, they're like, here we are, look at us, we're, we're doing this, you know, but they're thinking of themselves as representing a much bigger body of people than they actually were. And the massive advantage that the Athenians had over us is that they could always see with their own eyes a whole load of other people who were voting against them, even in the very moment of being, being asked the question. And I think that psychologically that must make a huge difference, that if you, you see yourself to be outnumbered, um, and I think that might actually explain why they were happy to accept majoritarianism as a decision procedure in a way that I think a lot of people today aren't really, because they could see the reality of, you know, that all those other people would have to be involved in this action that we're voting on, in this law that we're voting on. They are, they are players too, just like us, and they don't want to do it. And if they don't want to do it, it's not going to be successful. Or, you know, conversely, they really want to do this thing. There are loads more of them than, than, than the people on my side. And like, you know, I, okay, like we, we see them, maybe we don't agree. My side doesn't agree, but like, 
they're real people, they have these feelings, they have those commitments, let's give that a go. So particularly for, for the point of view of the losing minority, I think it's really important that the losing minority be able to actually you know, observe the number of people on the winning side. And I think that's something that that's, that's an ingredient in modern democratic politics that we hardly ever see. We wait for the returns in the elections and we're kind of, if, you know, I've, I mean, I've been in rooms with people where they're just like, who are these people? Who are these people voting the other way from me? The Athenians had some sense, that not everyone in the community, because not everyone is at the assembly, but they had some sense that they were, they were ordinary other people and, you know, they might be surprised by how they voted. Anyway, so that, that is one element of the kind of togetherness in the Athenian picture that I think I'm, I'm going to be pursuing more in my work. I mean, it's, I find it really interesting. I wanted to just throw it out there. One final thought, um, uh, just a very short, uh, just another, another kind of a supplementary question, is on your understanding of the common good. You talk quite a lot in the book about kind of Athenian public spiritedness and their orientation to the common good. Um, and it sounds a bit like uh, the kind of civic networks before and beyond the assembly, um, in the sense that it sounds a little bit like you think of an orientation to the common good as something that you come into a meeting with, um, that you know they just went in as these more public-spirited beings and that's what enabled them to get democratic politics off the ground. That it kind of pre-existed the, the actual democratic political procedure within their decision-making forum. And I just, I just want to throw out the thought, um, you know, is, it, is there an alternative vision possible where something like, they understood themselves in the assembly to be making a determination of what they unanimously would agree to be in the common interest, that they do that through majoritarianism, that they say, we unanimously agree that we will take this course of action to be the common good, including the people who voted against it. We, we make that determination and we express it in the form of their inscription, edoxe to demo, it, seemed to the demos that it was deemed by the demos that this is the thing we're going to do. It seems to me that maybe we have been slightly misled by Plato and the idea of a kind of pre-existing common good that exists kind of beyond the immediate agents when I think they thought they were constructing the common good or what they would collectively take to be in the common interest. They're constructing that in large part through their actual direct political activity. So it's not just about kind of they go to the festivals and they feel this community spirit and then they and then that eases the eases the political situation. It's actually about the way that they did politics face to face or in these huge groups. That in itself made it obvious to them that they were constructing uh, the 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 kind of what they would take to be the right the best course of action. Anyway, I'm th I'm throwing out I'm throwing out lots of different thoughts here. All this is stuff that I'm super interested in. I love the book for, for you know provoking these thoughts. And, and carry on with. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed. It. Thank you, Daniela, for this wonderful set of comments. Um, I think now we are turning the floor to uh, Professor Cartledge. Paul. Thanks for tuning into this panel. I too would like to begin with a word of thanks, especially, of course, to Jeff for writing the book, and especially, of course, to Keith for publishing it and for inviting me to participate. But also thanks to APT and HPT. And I've been very long associated with the latter, and I'm quite sick on the editorial advisory board of the School of Political Thought the journal. I've collaborated therefore frequently and over a very long period with my old and good friend Janet Coleman. And I'm sorry that Janet's longtime collaborator, Ian Hampshire Monk, isn't able to be with us this evening. And I wish him very well in these straitened times. Times that are not only straightened economically, culturally, politically, but times that are also out of joint, with special reference to the current and future state of democracy, not only globally, but more specifically, I think, within the United States and Europe. If I may quote from a recent review of Barbara Walters's ominously titled How Civil Wars Start and How to Stop Them, worryingly, we are starting to see previously strong democracies 
backslide to anocracy without a central for focus of power. Over the past decade, there has been, for the first time, a fall in the number of countries rated democratic. This includes numerous ones that had seemed to make it through the anocracy phase, such as Hungary and India. The same trends are hitting some of the world's strongest democracies in Western Europe and North America, with the rise of far-right parties that promote ethno-nationalist hatred. And of course, that quotation could be continued along the lines Jeff set out so clearly in his introductory remarks. Truly, therefore, Jeff Miller's new book is both well-timed, published, of course, symbolically on the first anniversary of the dreaded January the 6th. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I have to do something. There's something that's shuffling, papers shuffling. So if you really could just mute themselves just to make sure. And Paul, if you can check that you're not shuffling your papers in front of you and into your microphone, it's very distracting. So just to make sure we have a good quality of listening. Um, oh, it's thank you for intervening. That would have been me shuffling. Oh, I'm right. not so actually moving them. They were just in front of me, but I've now moved them <laughs> off my off my um, typewriter. So excellent. All right. Please. You know. I'm very sorry. So I apologize. I won't actually therefore be able to look at you as I speak. I have to turn my face to the left. I normally, by the way, when I give a talk on Zoom, use no notes whatsoever. But when you're given a slot of 10 minutes, it takes an awful lot longer to uh, give a paper without notes than it does with a text. So apologies for that. So truly, therefore, Jeff Miller's new book is both well-timed and timely, opportune, since democracy, that is our various versions of democracy, is indeed in crisis. In the original ancient Greek sense of that term, it's at the point of, it's at a moment of critical decision. <clears throat> if I may, I'm gonna preface my remarks on ostracism specifically by a couple of general remarks on Jeff's book as a whole, with apologies for any duplication or indeed contradiction of the remarks of my fellow panelists. To be honest, when I read the book's subtitle, Lessons from Ancient Athens, I was a little filled with apprehension. Was this to be another business management style how-to book advocating a return to the ancient Greeks, the ancient Athenians, in order to be taught simplistic and probably anachronistic lessons for current and future application to polities with totally different histories, institutional structures, and ideological premises? That is, of course, a rhetorical question. Happily, as you'll have inferred from the fact that I am speaking with you now, this is as far from being the case in the case of Jeff's book as is humanly possible. Jeff throughout pinpoints and underlines essential differences between our Western democracies and that, or rather actually since there were more than one, those, the democracies of the ancient Athenians between the late sixth and the towards the end of the fourth centuries BC or BCE. And one of the clearest ways in which he signals these differences is to, by devoting a whole chapter, about one sixth of the length of the entire text, to an institution for which there is not and could not, I think, conceivably be any modern direct parallel, namely ostracism about which he's already said uh, a great deal of relevance. In so doing, however, Jeff has, I think, set himself the difficult, if not impossible, task of finding any lesson that can be directly drawn from ancient Athenian democratic experience and applied to modern. Let me explain. As one of my American-based uh, ancient historian colleagues recently wrote, 
no one would advocate the introduction of Athenian style ostracism today. So the connection has to be a more remote one. And if I may be allowed to cheat just a little, I'm going to try to explain why that is so by quoting from an executive summary of a blog that I wrote for my own university's history and policy unit in 2006. Democracies in ancient Greece had a number of practices which made them very different from modern democratic systems. And one of those was ostracism. Elections, so-called free elections, are today often hailed as the hallmark of modern democracy. By Athenian Democrats, on the other hand, on the contrary, elections were regarded as likely to favor the most well-known, usually the richest and best educated male citizens, thus resulting in de facto oligarchy, the rule of the rich few. So in the Athenian democracy, most citizens, as Jeff has pointed out, were selected for public office, including judicial office, by lotteries, mainly in order to increase the chances of ordinary poor citizens being successful. Jeff's book, by the way, appears in Imprint Academics Sortition and Public Policy series, and the chapter uh, that follows on the one on ostracism is the one on sortition. There were, however, some votes to posts requiring special expertise, for example, military or financial expertise and leadership. But the corollary of that was severe punishment, often death, for inadequate performance by those so selected. Where ostracism came in, as practiced between the early 480s BC, BCE, and 416 BC only, though democracy had started earlier at Athens and it continued much later at Athens than 416, where it came in was as a special non-judicial mode of popular control by the masses over the elite, by the many over the few, by the poor over the rich. The practice had other functions, such as resolving deadlocks over foreign policy. I'll come back to that. And in very special circumstances, possibly also the function of preempting civil strife or even civil war. But for the uh, politicians, the leading politician individuals concerned, who in the absence of political parties functioned precisely as individuals, a sentence of ostracism, maximum 10 year of exile, was usually, usually final and deadly so far as their political career was concerned. All this Jeff gets absolutely right. And he makes excellent use of Aristotle's politics, though that was written, of course, at a time when ostracism, though still on the books of Athens, was not actually being practiced. He uses Aristotle's politics to bring out the most salient points at issue. Now, Aristotle, of course, was no radical Democrat. He abhorred what he considered the injustice of such a sentence of exile being inflicted on persons not otherwise guilty of any crime comparable to those for which exile was the punishment. But what he offers to Jeff is his, that is Aristotle's, fundamental analysis of democracy in any ancient Greek form as being essentially the rule of the poor as contrasted with and opposed to oligarchy, that being the rule of the rich. For Jeff, and quite rightly, I think, it is wealth inequality, the huge and growing gap today between the rich and the poor that possibly threatens most to vitiate or even undermine our democratic institutions and practices. And that is, I think, the principal theme of his ostracism chapter. However, 
And this is where the issue of how one can derive a lesson from what the Athenians did by looking at their practice of ostracism becomes uh, problematic. However, controlling or even diminishing the political power of the rich through, well, what are the available means, um, more or less restorative or punitive taxation, that doesn't seem to me quite the same sort of exercise of democratic power uh, comparable in any way to the aims and effects of ostracism in ancient Athens. Nor do our other available ways of dealing with those politicians whose influence is on the wane, and that of course was the case because the person who got ostracized, by definition, his influence was on the wane but who are still too important to be allowed to remain active at the center of domestic politics. Well, we, for instance, in Britain, we have a way of dealing with such people. We offer them appointment as heads of an Oxbridge college, or we send them as special envoys to the United Nations. But you see my point, that was not quite the same sort of thing as what uh, ancient ostracism was doing. Nothing like as potent. Well, if I may end by venturing a possible remedy, might a more accurate modern parallel to ostracism have something to do with our, I think, completely dysfunctional now in our country, as well as the states and in many others, party system? Might we somehow seek to use an equivalent of ostracism in order to weaken the potency of the major political party systems. For example, by granting somehow a major slice of direct access to political power to those who are not voting on party political lines on issues of national significance, critical national significance. COVID is one obvious one, defense is another one. And so uh, thank you again, Jeff, for prompting these thoughts. I look forward to hearing your and other contributors' uh, responses. Perfect. Uh, so thank you so much, Professor Kartlej. Now we are turning to Professor Hans Omer for our final remarks. And uh, let's try to keep enough time for a discussion if you can. Uh, Yes, sure. Um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this debate. Uh, I have found uh, Jeff's book quite convincing, well written. It was a pleasure to read it. And uh, what I will say will be, to some extent, uh, going in the same direction, because I do think uh, that Athens can provide us a source of inspiration. And I do think also that on this chapter on sortition, sortition is one of the, way, of the ways to uh, better a democracy now. Uh, at the time being, this weekend, there is a panel uh, in Poland organizing the frame of the Conference on the Future of Europe, organized by the EU, to think about the future of Europe. And this panel has been randomly selected. And uh, in the last couple of years, there has been an increasingly wave of experiments in this direction. Uh, actually, we can differentiate for the contemporary experiments two waves. The first one was basically, uh, the idea was basically to create a um, counterfactual public opinion which was only consultative, which was to some extent complementary to representative uh, electoral democracy. The second wave, which has developed since 15 years, uh, is going to more empowered mini public, randomly selected with more power, or at least more linked to the decision-making process and which a growing degree of institutionalization. What I would like to do is to raise four challenges or questions when one tries to get inspiration for, uh, from Athens on sortition as a mean of selecting those who can speak and in some cases decide 
for the people. The first challenge and the first question is, how do you link sortition on the one hand and citizenship, active citizenship on the other end? The title of the chapter is Sortition and the Deep Resources and of Citizenship. And the chapter on network of civic life and community functions as a complementary chapter, both sortition and a, a deep network of civic life are necessary to understand uh, the dynamic of Athenian radical democracy. What is exactly the relationships, sortition on the one hand and civic life on the other hand? Following Ober, uh, Jeff stresses the importance of strong and weak links among citizens which made it possible for randomly selected citizens to be embedded in their community. The contemporary sortition is quite different. The citizens who take part in many public uh, constitute a representative sample of the people, uh, which was not the case in Athens because this notion was not known. The size of the political community is much bigger which means that randomly selected citizens are disembedded from their community when they meet together in a mini public, at least beyond municipal level. What are the consequences of this? For example, is it necessary or, or possible to build links between the randomly selected mini public and the organized civil society, social movements, social networks, what, what is a relation, what is a possible relation between these institutions and the civic life which is advocated by Jeff? The second question. Um, in Athens, we had the assembly and we had randomly selected public offices, on the other hand. Most of the randomly selected public offices were linked to the assembly and to public policies, but there was also sortition for the juries. And perhaps this represents two different models for using sortitions. The jury model uh, is the following. You have to hear opposite views. Impartiality is crucial, and you have a neutral management of the case with no a few contacts with external actors and the media now. Politicization is something to be avoided. And in this direction, Jeff speaks uh, of a true deliberative consensus. The assembly model is quite different. So procedural fairness is important, but is only part of the story. In this model, citizens, the citizens' assembly, for example, the French citizens' assembly becomes a political actor which needs to make alliances to change politics and society. So there is, in this perspective, a politicization which is necessary for this assembly to behave as an assembly. Impartiality is less central and it's more, it, it is going more in the sense of an adversary politics, the citizen assembly being part of a political game, which is perhaps necessary for really changing society. To some extent, the Irish citizen assembly and the French citizen assembly did uh, give example of the jury model and of the assembly model. What is the best? Or are there different models which have to be adapted for different questions? The third question is about expertise. Uh, Jeff uh, demonstrates that in Athenian perspective, uh, there was a broader assumption about equality and citizen competence and the idea is that polit I mean, to be politically active and to be politically in the position to decide did not require any specialized knowledge. Still, uh, 
there were also experts in uh, Athens and uh, Athenians have found uh, an elegant way of avoiding that these experts could have a real power beyond elected politicians. There were also so many experts which were public slaves. And as slaves, they could not influence politics. No, we have much more experts. The state uh, is uh, much bigger than in Athens. And in many contemporary experiments using sortition, these experts deeply frame the deliberation of the randomly selected citizens. How is it possible to avoid that the way in which citizens will discuss when they meet in a mini public uh, be completely framed by experts? And last question, how to challenge a dark side of democracy? There is no democratic essence of sortition because in history, sortition has been used also by aristocratic uh, policies. But as a procedure and a ritual, sortition is a formal quality. It symbolically equalizes those among which sortition takes place and it excludes others. It's an exclusive club. And this was also true in Athens. There were two faces of the Athenian democracy just speaks about them, but for example, there never was a sortition organized among the Athenians, Athenian empire. And this is also a lesson for today. Liberal democracies were and still are an exclusive club, quite different for the insiders and the outsiders. And it required quite specific conditions for developing. In a time of transnational and, and globalization in the age of the Anthropocene, uh, this is very important to notice. In this context, is sortition better than election for the contemporary world? For example, do you think that it is easier to organize at transnational level or is it a possibility to, to represent future generations and non-human entities which cannot vote? Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, Eve. Um, so now the floor is um, given back to Jeff so we can give some brief answers, five to 10 minutes. Thanks very much. I, I really appreciate these comments and there's a lot a lot to think about and respond to here. I, what I'll probably do is I'll just uh, maybe pick one point from each of you and then we'll open up the floor and we can talk about other things more if, you, if you'd like to do that, right? So uh, going in reverse order, um, this question about expertise, especially in contemporary mini publics, I think this is a really interesting one, right? Eves points out that um, uh, experts that come in and talk to mini publics tend to frame the debate and constrain the choices, right, that the mini publics make uh, when, uh, even when they're deliberating amongst themselves. I, you know, I, I, I'm not an expert in this area, uh, so I have to confess that I'm not really sure um, uh, how to respond to that, although I think it's a really interesting problem. So I, I think the key to this would be, you know, if I was going to take just a first cut at it, is to say that, you know, you need to be able to make some space between different experts. I mean, if the experts are all saying one thing, then it's more of a problem. But if you have a, a range of opinion among the experts, then, then that actually opens up some space for deliberation, right? And then, of course, the other thing to always remind a mini public of is that just because something is factually true or most efficient does not necessarily mean that's the way that the mini public has to vote. It might be wise to do so often, right? But that's not necessarily the outcome. So a fact doesn't determine necessarily entirely, exclusively, right, the outcome. Otherwise, we, we would just hand it over to the, uh, to the experts. So I think uh, emphasizing the fact that this is a, a public debate and discussion, this is, this is really important. Um, I think, um, and actually, let me, let me jump over, Paul, back to Daniela for a second, because there was something I wanted to comment about her that's, that's related to this. She, she asks uh, at the end of her discussion about this idea of the common good that appears uh, in in my uh, chapter on this, um, and I, you know, when she was talking about this, I 
kind of felt like she was saying a little bit like, oh, I'm kind of constructing a Rousseauian idea of the general will and trying to put in there. I, I, don't, I don't think that the Athenians, you know, from my viewpoint, come into the assembly or to the law courts for that matter um, with a set idea of what the common good is. And I think there's some pretty good evidence for it. I, I think instead you, you, you see this space in which individuals debate. One, there's, there's a striking thing. If you look at the, um, in, the, uh, in the Corpus of Demosthenes speeches, there's a, a set of um, introductions that he has, kind of set pieces of introductions that you can kind of drop down into any, any situation. And one of the really fascinating things about those introductions that I noticed when I was reading through it is that none of them say we should cut off debate. None of them say we should end. Right? They always say we should reopen things, we should reconsider things, we should go back and think about things. So this, this is a, it's a small sign, but it's an important one, right? When you come to the assembly, you need to be willing to, to think about things again, right? You need to be able to reconsider things. So even if you do have some sort of idea, whether you think it's the, an idea of the general will or some sort of idea of the common good, or just an opinion about how things are to proceed, you need to be able to be open to hearing things that are new and different and changing your viewpoint. So I think that's a really kind of an intriguing little clue to the fact that it actually was a debate on the merits at the moment uh, with, your, with your fellow citizens, of course, right? Um, watching them, this is all very important. So I, I think that's, that's definitely what's going on there. It's not some sort of importation of, a, of an idea of the, of the common good to the assembly. Um, for Paul's point, I, uh, I confess that you're right. I don't have a really good uh, contemporary analogy <laughs> to ostracism as much as uh, I enjoyed watching Donald Trump's ostracism last January. <clears throat> um, I think, I think this is a problem, um, but I, I, I think that we're not going to be able to send someone out of the country. Obviously, that's just not going to work. Uh, there's really strict rules about free speech in the United States that seem to prevent us from actually, you know, curtailing speech to any great degree. We just happen to have gotten lucky that Trump's primary outlet was Twitter and deprived of that, he was pretty, pretty voiceless. Um, but I think just being conscious of and attentive to the fact that wealth, privilege, power, charisma, whatever it is, right, can really warp democratic space is an important thing to think about. And it can send you off in other directions. So, you know, you're not going to have an ostracism per se, but maybe we need to get more used to or more com comfortable with deplatforming. Maybe we need to kind of think about other ways of addressing a huge amount of power in the political sphere. So this could mean very anodynely, you know, we just strengthen campaign finance laws and, and enforce them seriously, right? That would be a really big step if we could actually do that. So talking about ostracism and saying, hey, the reasons the Athenians did this was because there was this problem and we can do it similarly with money, for example, this is, this is, this is key. So there are other things, right? Uh, reducing the revolving door between bureaucrats and business. This is another uh, way of, uh, of thinking about that. So yeah, I don't have a specific uh, example of ostracism uh, in the contemporary world that I could point to beyond Trump's deplatforming. Um, let me stop there. And if there are other questions or maybe the panelists wanna kind of follow up, ask me more specifically about one of the questions that I didn't address, I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to do that too. Thank you, Jeff. So we have about uh, 19 minutes left for sort of conversation, discussion, more questions from the audience. So I'm going to look at who has a little uh, hand mm. and call on you. So Jennifer Whitting, I see, has a question. Hi. Um, whoops. Hi, thank you. Uh, Hi. I found this very interesting. Unfortunately, I only just discovered about this recently and was just looking at, at the book and haven't had a chance to read it all. Um, and I'm also um, somewhat hesitant to question someone as distinguished as, as Professor Cartledge, but I, I'd like to ask about what he said about Aristotle um, and the taxonomy of forms of government and connect it with actually what you've just been talking about now, ways besides ostracism to deal with some of the problems we associate with uh, direct democracy. So, I, I mean, my understanding of Aristotle in the, in the politics, um, I, I think it's a three passage. He's saying that we can have rule by one and the proper form of that is kingship and the improper form is tyranny. We can have rule by the few. I mean, he, he does a quantitative uh, uh, taxonomy 
Um, and, and the proper form of that, the, the olig of that is the aristocracy and the, the deviant form is, is oligarchy. And then there's rule by the many and it's uh, democratia, democratia is de pejorative there. That's ruled by the poor rather than by what he calls politeia, which is inconvenient because it, it uses the same term for the, the, this particular kind of government as uh, the more generic term. But um, what's supposed to make the proper form proper in each case is concern for the common good, right? And the problem is that the, the monarch who rules in his own interest becomes a tyrant. The, the few who rule not for the common good, but, but for their, their own good uh, tend to be the wealthy. And in the democracy, the, the poor who are always many as there's, it's contingent that they're many, but um, tend to be as a matter of contingent effect, many get their way. Um, and of course there's all the associations with, with um, their not being uh, knowledgeable in the right sorts of ways, but um, I just wanted to um, know if you if you thought about that and about the way in which insisting that the debate focuses on the good of the the citizen the common good is the good of the citizens, however broad or narrowly that, that they extend. Um, the finance and politics would be another one. The problem with that is if you if you don't have a constitution to 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 mandate that. Um, these, you know, it, 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 there, there will be the kinds of concerns about the tyr tyranny, whoever happens to hold the, the majority uh, at, at the moment, whether it's the poor collectively or a few individuals. So I don't know, I mean, I'm taking a little bit of issue with the representation of democracy as sort of intrinsically associated with the poor and maybe less educated um, and think about other forms of uh, ways in which we're making what we call democracy now, you know, including universal education, you know, free education, all the kinds of things we, we hear about. So I, I just wondered if you, if you or Professor Cartlidge had any comments about that. Can I make a suggestion? Um, thank you for, for your question, Jennifer. It would be nice if we try to stay under two minutes when formulating the question. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's who I mean of people. Um, and then maybe we can group question three by three so that you know more people get in. So I see Owen wants to ask a question as well. Great, thank you. Um, Mike, I, I too haven't read the book, so these questions might just be born of plain ignorance. So I have two questions. Um, one is, even supposing that we think the Athenian political practices you describe work in the way as you describe them, works in the way they describe them, there might, wouldn't there still be a question of whether we want to live the lives of Athenian citizens? Um, so as we mentioned in passing, somebody mentioned in passing the amount of time spent in actually doing the business of politics that you know, Athenian democracy actually required is much more than what any contemporary democratic citizen does. And I wonder if that's actually a bad thing. Maybe that's too much doing of politics, kind of an overdoing of democratic politics. Um, so there's just this further question of whether we want to actually live those lives. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. And the second question is, um, again, might be born of plain ignorance. Are those practices compatible with the conditions of moral pluralism that characterize modern societies? Now, of course, ancient Greeks think a lot about uh, civil strife and civil war, but it seems to be a consensus view that moral pluralism and moral disagreement is something that is really not a central concern of, of Greek ethical thought, and perhaps that shows up in Athenian political practices, or maybe not. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. So yeah, do we want to live a, the lives of Athenian citizens, and are these practices compatible with uh, moral pluralism? Jeff, do you want to take those two? It's, uh, it's yeah, uh, sure. Uh, first off, do we want to be Athenians? Uh, probably not, right? Uh, given the sort of demands that the Athens placed on its on its on its citizens, um, I think I think you're right to point out that there's a it, within liberalism there's sort of a, 
almost a centripetal pull away from the public sphere, right? Out into the private sphere. We all have our own particular ideas of the good life. And very few of those ideas of the good life, ideas of the good life probably involve going and working in Washington, DC or London, right? We, this, is, this is not what most people want. Um, and in fact, we're kind of encouraged to go off into the private sphere and, and pursue these things. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I guess I, I would say first off that I, I'm not interested in being an Athenian or having that sort of level of commitment, I don't think it would be sustainable in today's in today's world. But I guess the point of the book is not so much that we should be exactly like the Athenians and pick up that level of civic duty, but rather that we've gone too far in the opposite direction, right? So I view this as sort of more of a corrective. We need to kind of be pushed back in the other direction, pushed back towards the public sphere, pushed back towards a sense of civic duty, pushed back towards a sense of responsibility to people around us, and out of our little private silos, right, either online or in person, right? So uh, again, I don't want to give up on liberalism, um, but I think liberalism has become too balkanized and atomistic, um, especially with the internet. So uh, I don't know if that's enough of an answer for you, but um, I'm not, don't, don't want to do that. Um, and I, I think similarly, you know, about moral pluralism, right? Uh, diversities, uh, diver diverse views on the idea of the good life and divide, diverse ideas on, on what the good is, period. Right? It seemed to be a fact of the modern world. I can't see that changing anymore. But um, I do think uh, that we could afford a little more discussion on this. Not that we're going to ever reach consensus on it, but debate and deliberation and having it foregrounded in a way that it's not, at least not in the United States, or very rarely in the United States. Having it foregrounded, I think, is important, if only to make people think about it and address claims that are made by people that they might disagree with, right? So having these discussions, I think, in the public sphere, there's something inherently value about, value about that, um, even if we, again, kind of can't come together and uh, come up with some sort of unified idea of the good life or, or the good, right? That's just not going to happen. Um, going back to uh, uh, Jennifer's question, I, um, I think part of it was for Paul, um, but let me let me also just say just one quick thing about Aristotle to her, and that is that you know Aristotle is critical of democracy, but he's also, I know sometimes you, you imagine a little bit a little bit grudgingly appreciative of it as well, right? He does say, for example, that oh yeah, sometimes a bunch of people making a decision can be better, right, can lead to a better result, right, than a particular expert, than any one particular authoritative figure. Um, so there are these sort of moments in the politics where he does seem to at least recognize that there, there's some point to this sort of decision-making process that the Athenians have, even though he may be a little bit skeptical of, of what he views as, it, as its very extreme measures. I don't know, Paul, I think she asked you some specific questions if you want to weigh in. Sure, let me just very quickly perhaps clear up a purely factual point about Jennifer's uh, comment. My point about Aristotle was simply to make the point that he was an analyst of political forms, the most encompassing the polis itself, such that we humans are all political animals in the sense that we are polis animals, not political in our sense, but designed by our natures to achieve our fulfillment only within the peculiar ancient Greek state form of the polis. So that doesn't actually have a very wide resonance if you don't accept that the polis is the, as it were, Darwinian goal of humanity in political terms. The other point I was making was that Aristotle, though not, as Jeff says, overtly hostile to all forms of democracy, discriminated between four different kinds on the sliding scale. Ditto oligarchy, he was very precise. There are different kinds of democracies, there are different kinds of oligarchies. And his ideal was a combination of one variant, we might say, in the Omicron sense of a democracy with a variant of uh, oligarchy, beca becoming his peculiar notion of polity, which, as Jennifer said, is confusing as a term. But let me just quote you this deliberately provocative and paradoxical remark. Aristotle said that democracy was the rule of the poor, not the rule of the many. And he said that even in the extraordinary against um, existence case, that the rich citizens constituted a majority, he would still call their rule oligarchy, 
not democracy, because for him, the essence of those two political systems was nothing to do with numbers, but with quality. Now, I didn't talk about, though you may have thought I was talking about the common good. I wasn't commenting on Aristotle's evaluation morally of any particular form of either democratia or oligarchia. Thank you very much for your comment and intervention there. So I, I don't see any more questions, so I'll, I'll uh, pose one to this distinguished panel. It's, it's rare to have so many uh, you know, specialists of uh, ancient Greece assembled. So I, I would love to have your views on, on a puzzle that, um, that has been, that, 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 you know, that poses itself in the context of mini publics in the modern world. So we have this convention for climate in France, for example, a citizens convention for climate, 150 people. And of course it's heavily structured and micromanaged and, and governed from the outside by all these participatory experts. Um, at the top, you had a, a group of 15 people making decisions about the agenda, the experts to consult, etc. Then you had um, providers, you know, that, that specialize in facilitating these kind of events that made all kinds of invisible decisions about the pace, about the, you know, the number of subgroups, et cetera, et cetera. And, I, and, and so naturally a critic say, well, look, I mean, what's really sovereign or, or authentic about any of this? It's all framed and structured from the outside. So there's a lot of path dependency. So how did it work in ancient Greece where, you know, you had these bodies selected by lot, like 500, we're not talking just 150, but 500 people, a thousand people. And how did they organize, self-organize? They didn't have the, the logic of parties. They didn't have a whip. They didn't have a, all these internal leaders that were clearly identified as hierarchies. So how did that work concretely? And could we copy that model in the modern world? Well, I, I'd give a kind of a first uh, stab at that, then turn it over to the, to the experts, right? Uh, but I, it's actually pretty astonishing that there's not in Athens in the fifth and fourth century, a strong enforcement mechanism in the city. We think about you know, the, the police or the judicial system here or, or various elements of the bureaucracy that force people to do things and make sure that they're kind of following the laws. That sort of infrastructure was largely lacking um, in Athens, right? There wasn't even really a police force in the sense that we would recognize it, right? So that means that you know, when you go to the assembly and you deliberate and you debate and you decide on something, you're part of the, process of getting that done, right? In our legislatures today, right, the member of Congress votes for a law, that law then gets shunted over to the bureaucracy and the legal structure and they enforce it, right? There's actually this mechanism that does it. The theme is like that, right? So that, that right there, that's kind of astonishing, right? That people would have the commitment, right, to see the law passed, right? As, as Jennifer said, they see all of these people saying, oh, this is what we should do. And then going ahead and by and large, not everyone, not all the time, right? There were free riders in ancient Athens like there are today, but enacting this, right? That, that sense of civic responsibility and duty is something just totally absent, I think, today, by and large. So that takes care of one, one problem, which is the motivation, but I, I'm, I'm thinking of that, the, the logistics, like. When, when the 150 citizens of the convention were left by themselves in a room, it became total chaos. Uh, you know, we need procedures, we need sort of a thing that, so I'm curious about what the others have to say to that. Daniela, maybe, and then Paul? Yeah, I, I think that may have been a slightly overdrawn picture because the Athenians did have quite a lot of steering committees and, and, kind of, and officers chosen by lot, so it was just, you're thinking mostly of the council. I mean, the, the, you know, the parallel would be the council, the 500 people. Um, and they had, they had these uh, sections of them who were called in Brittany for 40 days. Um, uh, th they would be kind of the steering committee for the council. And then even within that, they had smaller numbers who were doing particular things. They had one president every day rotating through. Mm -hmm. I mean, they did have a hierarchy, absolutely. And in terms of their judicial system. I mean, they had a very, they had a very significant judicial system. There were laws; people had to obey them. They had audits um, of people, people in positions of power, um, who'd been entrusted with particular duties. Uh, so, you know, they 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 did the scrutiny before they entered on, on office, and then they had the kind of yeah, both ethical and financial audits. Elsina, um, kind of when they stepped down, they had a lot of oversight. So they'd set up a bureaucracy. The really interesting thing is that they had people rotate through that. 
So I would say they actually had quite high functioning hierarchy and it mirrors the military. I mean, it's not a, I think we kind of forget that they were also electing their generals, their kind of naval commanders, or the lower level military commanders. The polis itself was kind of more, had more parallels with, with kind of a military body. And in fact, you know, just oh. essentially was a military body than I think we sometimes realize. And that requires a very high level of organization. So they had that. The interesting thing is that, that the people giving the last word on how well the officers are performing their jobs were these masses of ordinary citizens, both in the courts, very importantly, um, but also in the assemblies. I mean, the assembly, I guess we've also in the play this a little bit, and they were voting for their generals and their, their naval commanders in the assembly, who they would then obey on the battlefield or, or you know, at sea. Um, but doing the policies that the audience themselves had chosen, like, you know, we are going to go and fight against these people. So there is a, there is a, there is a complicated dialectical relationship here. I mean, there's the audience, the mass audience determines the course of action, elect people to carry that out, then obey them outside when they're doing those, that course of action. Um, but then they also can trigger these kind of um, impeachments and other forms of audit of the people, the people in the positions of responsibility. So I, I actually would, yeah, I would argue strongly in favor actually of saying that, you know, that they had a complicated and effective hierarchy and to some extent bureaucracy if you take out the thought that it's a, a standing kind of cadre. It's not, it's a rotating through mm -hmm. the, the citizens, but the citizens are playing those roles, the roles of the Senate, I would say. When they did have a kind of police force, I mean, they had the, the, you know, they had a little bit of a, you know, just a very small one for people who could apprehend criminals on the spot. Um, slaves, actually. So yeah, that's something to think about as well. Um, but yeah, I, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, if you want to have the last words, we have a few minutes, uh, one minute really left, but. Paul, did you, okay, so I'm not sure he's hearing me. Um, well, in that case, I think we, we're, you know, we, we're at time anyway, so I, um, I'm going to, um, um, you know, um, thank the panelists, uh, thank Kista Zolen for organizing the panel, thank of course, Jeff Miller for a wonderful book and uh, everyone for an incredible discussion to be continued, I'm sure. Thank you very much and a round of applause for, for um, our speakers.